All right, how's everybody doing today? Good? All right, so uh, my name is David Sankel, and I work at Adobe. And this talk's gonna be about Rust features that I want in C++. Um, and I just wanna point out a couple things about this image here. Uh, there are three things that make it very cool. Um, number one, my artistic talent. Uh, okay, well maybe not so much that, but this right here, this picture, this was taken in the, uh, the tour that we had a couple of days ago. So this is in, uh, what is the lowest art gallery in the world? Uh, so that's Tel Aviv. Um, and it's also cool because it looks kind of decent because I photoshopped it, right? That's where the Adobe piece comes from. So um, what, what, what's this talk going to be about? Um, we're going to go over some Rust features. Uh, let me zoom this in a little bit here. We're going to talk about, you know, what is the feature? Why is it useful? Um, but then how can the gap in C++ be closed, right? Because the, the idea of this talk is not to, you know, get everybody to use Rust, it's to figure out how do we get the things that we like from Rust into C++. All right, and we're going to talk about a lot of features. We're going to talk about language variants, reflection, injection, a bunch of tools for system engineers. Um, we're going to be talking about concurrency and community, which is a really interesting aspect of it. And I know that as you hear me now, and or as you hear me as we get into it, you're going to think I am biased. And I am totally biased, so let's just get this out of the way. I want to talk about what my biases are, and how much my biases align with your biases is going to be relative to the you know, usefulness of this talk. Um, so I, I'm, I have my list, you'll have your lists, and, and let's see. So what are my biases? First, I have historically worked on very large systems. We're talking millions and millions of lines of code. And every time you add a zero to the number of lines of code that you're working with, you get a whole different set of issues you have to deal with. So I work with very large systems um, that have lots of moving parts and uh, they live a long time. Uh, you, know, you know when Photoshop was made? That's like a long time ago, you know, decades and decades. I previously worked at Bloomberg, their software worked. Uh, I started working, I think, when I was born. Um, so software lives a very long time, and also the software doesn't just stick around, right? You need to go into it and muck with it all the time because of changing requirements, because of changing compilers. There's all kinds of reasons for people to be mucking around in the software that I work with, okay? And that gives a set of issues that I have to deal with. Um, so my primary concerns are first, continuous integration, or continuous operation of the system. System can't go down, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, my systems need to have no bugs. In fact, if you have a certain number of zeros in your lines of code, you know you have bugs in your system, yet they're still deployed and they're still being used. Eliminating all bugs uh, has never been an even achievable, hopeful thing in the size of the systems that I work with. Um, so it doesn't mean no bugs, this is a caveat there. And I also care about time to market, okay? Um, and this is short and long-term time to market. What do I mean by that? Short-term time to market, you get a call. Hey, you need this feature. You need to deliver it like tomorrow, okay? Yesterday, uh, yesterday. <laughs> even better, right? And then you, you do that, and that's important because you need to get your features released. But long-term time to market, that means that five years from now, when you get that call, you're still able to deliver something in a reasonable amount of time. So accumulation of tech debt, which makes you get longer and longer time to market, that's a big problem. So that's why I have a big bias towards long-term time to market. If it takes a little bit more time to do it right, do it. Because we don't want to sacrifice the future of the company uh, because of the now of the company, in most cases, in the cases that I work with anyway. So, some caveats. I am not a Rust expert by any stretch, okay? I'm not a Rust developer. I haven't like written a Rust compiler. Um, I am just a user, and I also have never done a large-scale project in Rust before. There aren't really that many. There's maybe like one, and they certainly aren't long-lived. Um, so, you know, this is just my take on the Rust universe, how it can be used based on my experience on working with real large-scale systems. All right, does that make sense? Is that okay with everybody? Are my biases cool? Yes, you like my biases? Well, these ones anyway, you don't like my other ones. All right, so, why Rust? Why are we even talking about this? So, how many of you get too many emails? 
like not everybody's raising their hand. That's like, that's amazing. I get, I get way too many emails and I get a bunch of recruiting emails and I'm sure many of you get a bunch of recruiting emails and I just kind of look at them and then I archive them and, and move on. Um, but one trend that I've noticed is I see a lot more recruiting emails instead of saying we need a C++ developer, they're saying we need a Rust developer. And I found this to be really curious, like what, what, where's all this coming from? Why are they saying they want Rust developers all of a sudden? And if you look into these companies, you'll notice they're not frequently the big companies, you know, the, the Googles and the Intels of the world. The ones that are looking for Rust developers are small companies. They're the ones that are building their software capital right now. They're the future, uh, well, failures, most of them, but some of them are gonna be the future, like Intels and, and, and Apples and, why am I saying computer companies? They're software companies, future Microsofts. Um, and that means there's something that's interesting there, right? So I wanted to look into it. And I looked into it and there are some, some interesting statistics about this. For every 10 C++ pull requests, there's one, pull re one Rust pull request in GitHub right now. And that is huge. You think of the scale of C++ developers, like there are millions and millions of C++ developers, yet there's one out of every 10 pull requests in GitHub is a Rust pull request. So that makes you wanna pay attention. Another thing is that in 2021, there was the Stack Overflow um, like developer survey, which had 83,000 respondents, so good sample size. And for every 3.5 professional C++ developers, there's one Rust professional developer. I mean, it's kind of hard to believe, but that's, these are the numbers, right? We have to look at them and we have to accept them. Um, so there's something to this Rust thing. And then there's another thing with the same Stack Overflow survey is that it was voted the most loved language for a bunch of years in, the, in a row, right? Languages come and go, you know, you have things that get more popular, they get less popular, but, Ro, but Rust seems to be sticking there and it seems to be sticking at the top of this particular list, all right? So that's interesting. What does Rust say about itself? And before I tell you what Rust says about itself, this is different than what I think is interesting about Rust, but this is how they advertise themselves. They say that they're uh, involved in performance, you know, they care, care, care about fast and memory efficient software. Well, that's C++ wheels house, right? That's, that's definitely the same area. They also care about reliability. They have a rich type system. Uh, they have older ownership model guarantees. We'll talk a little bit about this later. And they also say that they, they are about being productive. So they, have, they talk about their docs. They talk about having friendly compiler and, and great tooling. All right. So I, I, like I said, I disagree that these are the selling points of Rust. Um, there, there's some overlap, though. Uh, but this is what Rust says about itself. So let's go into it. Let's see the things about Rust that I like that I wish I had in C++. We'll start with language variants, okay? So we have enums in C++, and here you have your, your basic enum class, uh, you know, enum class color. This should be very familiar to all of you. Um, the way this works, if I wanna take, create a variable of this enum type, I just say equal color colon colon red. Um, and then here's an, uh, like a piece of code here. You can say C equals status, static cast color of int. Um, now, if you remember from your, your initial classes in C++, oh, terrible, um, red is zero, right? Green is one, blue is two, and here we're static casting three into C. Is this, is this correct in portable C++ code? Yeah. What about if it was four? No. <laughs> there are some, like, complex rules about this, um, but, uh, but anyway, three is okay. What, what's going on here is that in C++, enums are really integral types that have like named constants. That's, that's what they are. But we use them for something like this. We really don't think that three is a valid value of that color. You would, you would see that and you would think that's a bug in most uh, scenarios. Um, so let's see how this compares to Rust. Okay, Rust, enum. This looks the exact same. This is, there's no difference here. Um, if you, you can kind of figure out the syntax by looking at it by squinting a little bit, but basically we're creating a mutable variable C. This is just like creating a variable C of that type. And color colon colon red is its value. That's fine, looks just like C++. Now if you try to make this thing three, it gives you an error 
and says, oh, you have an integer and you're trying to convert it into this enum, you can't do that. There, there's no way to co coerce Rust into taking an int and making it into that. Um, it just doesn't work. It's just one of those three things. So C++, in, uh, C++ enums are just like integral types with named constants, like, yeah. Um, and Rust enums are more like types that can be any one of those listed types uh, or those listed values. Is there anything familiar in C++ to that? Yeah, this is similar to a variant. So let's just see what a variant looks like in C++ if we wanted to do this. Um, we have these classes, red, green, and blue, and, uh, and they're just empty bodies, which means there's only one value of each one of those types. Um, and then we have a using declaration or a type def saying color is a variant of red or green or blue. Now we have auto C equals color red. Okay, that's decent syntax. And if we try to assign it to four, it will give you a compile error. And there's really no way to coerce a standard variant into uh, being an int. Uh, it just it doesn't make any sense. So yeah, you can do that, um, but it's kind of ugly. I, I think it's ugly. You think it's ugly? Yeah, yeah it's pretty ugly. OK. Um, and another issue is that a unique type wasn't introduced. You actually introduced three different types. And that last one is a type def, which, you know, as you've seen in Walter's talk, is it'd be nice if you had to make a new unique type as opposed to having a variant hanging around. Now, there are ways around this. Um, you can use inheritance in funny ways. You can do other, like, things to make it so that you get a unique type. But they're all even more ugly for the most part. Um, and really, that's not what variants are for, right? The variants are, are supposed to have the, the different types in there, the different alternatives. are supposed to carry many different kinds of values. Right? They're not supposed to just be like these one-off things. So it turns out that uh, Rust can, can do that even better. So here we have a Rust enum called game, uh, game event, okay? Game event has three different kind of states. You can think about it, three different alternatives. The first one is just like an enum. It's just player died. That's the state of your system. All right, or it can be in the state of key press, right? You get a key press, but this carries some data with it. It carries a, a char, it tells you which key was pressed. Or it could, it could be this thing called click, it'd be in a click state, and this carries an X and a Y, each being uh, float 32 values, right? That's kind of nice, that's, that's what variant was designed to do, this kind of thing. Now if you want to use this, um, you create these values in a similar way, game event colon colon player loss, that's just like when you create an enum. Um, but now if you want to create a key press, you pass along the data that the key press state needs to have. Or if you want to use click, here you pass in the x and y coordinates and you get this pretty handy syntax for x and y. Um, now if you want to break this thing out or do like what you do with a variant with a visit, um, you use what's called pattern matching. Okay, so you match on E in this case, which is your game event, and if it happens to be the player lost case, you do this action. If it happens to be a key press with a lowercase q or an uppercase q, then you do this. If it's a key press with anything else, so underscore means like a wild card, anything else, then you do this other thing. And then finally you have the click here, you get the x and the y, and then you can output what the x and y were. Just really concise syntax, right? Now, okay, that's fine, but like, what can you do with it? So there's this library in Rust called pull down C mark, okay? And this is a markdown parser. When you think about writing a parser in C++, you're thinking of one of two things usually. One is that you parse it into an abstract syntax tree, right? You get a parse tree, then you take your parse tree and you do your processing with that. The other kind of parser is um, is one where it's like a sax parser. You, you basically put in this visitor class that has a bunch of member functions that are called every time you encounter a particular syntactic element. Like you reach a heading and then it calls your handle heading function and so on and so forth. But this thing, this, is, uh, this pull mark is, is written in a completely different way. So instead of pushing the, 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 uh, the syntax at you, like it would in a variant, you're kind of responding to getting pushed, this is pull-based, you pull out the syntactic elements. So let's see what that looks like. 
So assume that you have this parser made in this library, and here what we're doing in this first little snippet of code, if you can kind of ignore the first line we're doing, except that we're doing a pattern match here, is every time we get a soft break, um, we convert that into a hard break. And any time we get something else, we just uh, pass the event on as it is. Okay, because we're kind of filtering now what the parsed value is into a new stream of parsed elements, I guess you could say. All right, here's another one where we just take the existing parser that we created above, and now we're going to say, oh, every time you happen to see a, um, a text event, like some text in a markdown, and it happens to be, uh, or well, any text event, if you happen to see T-E-H, that's probably a misspelling, convert it into T-H-E. And anything else, just pass it on. Right, really compact syntax. Think of what, what this would look like if you had to write visitors in C++. Each one of these little tiny snippets of code would require writing a separate class and uh, with a bunch of specialized member functions that are overriding virtual member functions. Um, it would just be kind of nasty. So pattern matching, pretty cool. Um, so what do I want? I really want language variants in C++. I want what Rust Enums has. Um, and if you ever have worked with a system that has this kind of thing, you'll see they're almost as ubiquitous as classes. This is not a feature that would be like, oh, you know, some like concurrency experts that are specialists would use this feature. This would be a feature that everybody in this room would use probably on a daily basis, right? So this has very wide reach. And this is a very basic tool of programming. Even if you go into um, the theoretical computer science folks, right? They're gonna tell you that there are product types, which are like classes, and there are some types, which are like variants or language level variants. It's like a fundamental building block of programming. We really ought to have these in C++. And I also want pattern matching, okay? And, and pattern matching, you need them for, uh, for language variants. There's no way you can have them without it. That's how you get things in there, but, uh, or get things out of there, but they're useful all over the place uh, in a very similar way. So, what's the gap? So I proposed language variants back in 2015. This was when we were trying to get variants into C++ 17. And there was a bunch of discussion about like, what's the proper interface? Um, and I wrote, uh, in this same mailing, I wrote like two, two pages about, or two papers on, on what library variants should look like, and this one about language variants. And this is just a very basic syntax here. Um, I called them enum union, like our enumerated unions. Uh, people didn't like that. Um, but basically, a, a similar syntax, but maybe less refined than the Rust one. Um, and I was proposing that we use uh, pattern matching. We just make switches more powerful. Um, so here we have a switch which, which opens up this uh, command that I have on the screen. Um, syntax here doesn't really matter, but the, the important thing is that it got proposed back in 2015. So um, what did the committee think? What do you think? You think the committee wanted it or didn't want it? Think didn't? It did. It did. The committee was like, yes, this is great. There was only one person that was against it, and it happened to be Bjarna, which is a big deal. But anyway, the rest of the people really thought this was cool, and, uh, and so we did some work on it. Um, but complexity is a major hurdle in C++. It's, it's, it's not easy to just like add something like this into it. In fact, the syntax you saw on the previous screen, there's no way it could possibly work. There was like parsing ambiguities and all kinds of things that I didn't see. Um, but what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna separate this proposal into three different proposals. We have some syntax to opt in because if we have pattern matching, it'd be great if you could take like a standard variant and then use this language feature or your own custom variant and use this language feature. Um, we have pattern matching itself, and then we have language variants uh, by themselves, so we broke it up into three different proposals. Um, there was also, so that added some complexity and it delayed time because we have to work on each of the proposals independently. Um, but then there's also this exception thrown on the constructor thing. So if you know anything about variants, you know that there's some kind of strange issue. Remember this valueless by exception state? Well, that doesn't go away if you have language variants. You still need to solve that problem. And, and it's a little bit even more complex to try to solve it on a language basis. So there's that. And then there's backwards compatibility, right? Because we wanted to use underscore as our wildcard. That'd be great, but there are some libraries out there 
um, that happen to be using wildcard as an identifier. And some of them might be even a little bit popular, like Google Test. So, yeah, that didn't really work out too well. We tried to propose something to work around it, like make it you know, context specific, but the committee wasn't having it. So what we're kind of stuck with at this point is double underscore. Ugh. Well, I mean, I don't really care that much as long as we get it. Um, why not the keyword default? I don't know, it, it just kind of makes me sick when I think about it. Um, <laughs> but maybe, I mean, as long as we get something, I, I, I don't mind. Uh, it's because it's too long. Like you want these to be like concise. Um, so there's also competing visions for the design. So we had a design, we pushed it forward uh, a little bit, and, uh, and then Herb Sutter came out with a paper and he's like, hey, I've got an idea for Herb patterns, right? Which is great, it's a cool idea, very cool idea. Um, what we were proposing was more traditional like what's done in other languages. But whenever you have competing proposals, what happens is things really slow down, right? So uh, that's where we're at. So the latest papers, you can see the, the one that I'm involved in, uh, which is the first one, and then the second one is Herb's paper. Uh, the authors are all working together with Herb to try to incorporate his best ideas and to remove the things that just can't possibly work, and we already figured that out. Um, and hopefully we'll get somewhere. But I will tell you that work seems to have pause at this point on pattern matching, language variant, all this kind of stuff. Um, and you'll see this a couple times as we go through this. The pandemic really kind of slowed down committee work on some major proposals. But hopefully as things are now opening up and we have real conferences in person and things like this, and we have our first in-person C++ meeting coming up in November, we can get these things ramping again. Uh, but that's what the gap is, all right? So we're gonna move on to another interesting feature in Rust that I really want in C++. This one is reflection and injection in active use. And active use, I'll tell you what that means uh, in a minute. So let's look at argument parsing in C++. CLI 11, this is kind of the most recommended command line parsing library out there. So if you're parsing command lines, you should probably check this out before you check out the other things. Um, so this is made by Henry Schreiner and it's on GitHub there. Just to walk through the code, you create this app object and with the name of the program, and then you create a variable which is gonna hold the parsed result of your command line parsing. And here we have, we set it initially equal to default, so this will be the default value if it's not specified. And we add these options, dash F, dash dash F, the short and long version of the command line parsing option uh, with a little help string there. Very similar thing for debug, except debug is just a bool in this case. It's just either have dash dash debug or you don't have it. And then you call this macro. Now, um, this is coming from their example. You actually don't have to use a macro with this library. This macro hides exceptions in case people like see exceptions and get really scared. Um, but whatever, they used a macro, this is their example. I probably wouldn't use the macro in my case, but anyway, this is what's doing the actual parsing thing, and then as you move on in your program, you have file name and debug set to the values of your parsed uh, string, or if you have an error, then it'll just error out, okay, if you, if you type in something wrong. All right. Const doesn't really work with this. I love const. Do you all love const? Yeah, const is great, const is great. It's great when you read code and you see something const up here, and then you can skip everything in between, and you get to the bottom, you know that that value hasn't changed, unless somebody uses const cast and does some really bad stuff. But anyway, <laughs> it really, it's, it's pretty much there, and you can reason about code with, when things are const. So const won't work here, because this is doing, modifying the file name variable, and it's modifying the debug variable. Okay, so you don't get that tier. Um, unit testing is, is difficult with this. How do you unit test this? Well, I'll tell you how most people unit test it. They don't, okay? And the people that do test it, what I usually see is they run like an integration test. They have a script which runs the, the, the program over and over again with different command line options and make sure that they work. It's not really a unit test. So the fact that this interface doesn't allow me to test very well is uh, a bit of a drawback. All right, let's look at what Rust does. So Rust has this library called structopt, okay? So first, just note 
that we're creating a struct. This is like creating a class in C++. And uh, if you ignore all the comments there, comments, um, you see that there's a debug uh, member variable, which is of type bool, and a file member variable, which is of type string. Okay? And you see that what's going on is we're doing some magic here, okay? And these are kind of like attributes in C++, right? So it's adding some additional information on top of my struct that uh, Rust metaprogramming facilities can give you access to and do things with. And you happen to see that the app descri description's in there. Now, if you look at the debug, you'll see the, this little annotation here, this uh, thing above it. It says struct op, which is the name of the library. And then it says short, comma, long. And what that means is that the following declaration, that debug below, should be an option, and it should have a short form and a long form. The short form, dash D, the long form, dash, dash, debug. How did it get debug? How did it figure out D? Because it has reflection capability, right? It looks at that variable and it's like, oh, debug. It begins with a D, debug is the whole word. I can get that as a string, and that can be an option. And then here is where we have uh, the file, uh, variable here, which is a string, right? So this is, has a short and long option as well. Here we also specify a default value and a help string. All this is annotations to the code. Now if I want to actually parse using this fancy thing, I do this. I call opt colon colon from args, which is a static function of this opt struct that got automatically created through the reflection facilities and injection facilities. And opt there, you note that unlike all the other declarations that I had before, this one doesn't have a mute in front of it. So let opt in Rust is just saying this is const. So now we have something which is const. Pretty sweet, right? I don't have to repeat myself. Um, if I get file wrong here or wrong in the documentation or something like that, it's all using uh, in just one spot, uh, that, that string of characters. And this is very declarative, which is fantastic. And uh, if you run this thing with dash dash help, I want you to note this looks like your normal dash dash kind of help text, but also you see with dash dash file, on the right it says a help string, and then it puts in brackets, default is this other thing. It was able to grab the default at compile time from that annotation and use that as part of the help documentation. It's pretty nice, pretty nice. So this is just a use of a library produced by the metaprogramming facilities in Rust, okay? Let's talk about f-strings. So in C++, we've had an evolution in uh, outputting things, right? This used to be, when I, when I first learned C++, this was what you had to do, you use C out. C out, I is this, left shift operator, um, I, left shift, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, when I was using this, I, I never, I, I had worked with Pascal a little bit. I had seen a little bit of Python. Um, this looked pretty verbose. I never liked this. It was just kind of ugly, it worked. I could see some benefits of it. But anyway, in C20, uh, now we have std format. Okay, so std format takes in a string, and then you put these little placeholders in there, these uh, left curly, right curlies, and then you pass in what you want, the expressions that you want those curlies to resolve to. All right? And then in C23, we got even better, and now we don't need to use C out, we just do std print, and uh, you get the nice format string. Okay? We've evolved, right? It took a long time. Okay? You see those years? Long time. Now, let's look at Python. It's supposed to be a talk about Rust, but let's look at Python anyway. So, and Python had a very similar evolution. When you were using Python 2.5, or maybe you've never used it, I used it back in the day, um, you had to print out stuff like this. It's kind of like the C++ version, maybe a, the original C++ a little bit better, right? It's like a variadic uh, arguments there, you put in things, um, that's how it looked, but nobody liked that syntax because you get these complex expressions in your format string and it just, it's hard to read sometimes, or something. Um, but anyway, in Python 2.6, they came up with a format, which I, 
I would probably guess that the C++ version of format was based off of this, and maybe this was based off of something else. It looks very similar, right? But then, in Python 3.6, in, in, in the year 2016, they did this, which is really, uh, it kind of struck me. I was like, why did they do that? So what happened is like in your string, you put the curly brackets, and in the curly brackets, you put your expressions. And um, I tried using it because it was the newest thing in Python, and it turns out this is really nice. This is, this is the syntax you want. Um, you do a lot of text processing in Python. You do a lot of text processing in, in most languages. And this syntax just like is top notch. Really, really nice. F strings. Okay? And um, so Rust, let's see what its evolution was. So they started in Rust 2018 and earlier with this print function. So this kind of looks like the state of the art in C right now. Um, and then in 2019, somebody was like, hey, I like F strings in Python. Let me see if I can implement this in Rust as a library feature. Right? You see that? They implemented it as a library feature. That's powerful metaprogramming capability right there. And then, just April this year, they said, hey, that's great. Let's make this standard. And so now it's part of the Rust standard library. But look at the timeline. 2019, 2022, very rapid evolution. You can evolve a language or a library much quicker. You can evolve a library much quicker than you can evolve a language, right? So powerful metaprogramming capabilities do that. One other example I want to show you, there's this, uh, this library called Rocket. All right, so first just note that we have a function here. It just takes in a name, which is a string, and an age, which is a 8-bit unsigned and it returns a string. And the string it returns is blah, 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 hello, whatever. Now the key thing here is this. What this is saying is, hey, take this little function and make it into an HTTP REST service call with, with get, with this path, slash hello, slash brackets name, slash age. And it does it, that's it. That's how you can make a little, uh, like a getter rest service with this thing. And what happens if you misspell age or name or something like that? Compile error, right? Think of how much code you'd have to do in C++ to make this happen, right? Quite a bit. So this is only scratching the surface of Rocket. There's a lot of cool things that this library can do. Um, what do I want out of this? I want the libraries that this metaprogramming power produces. I want those things. And by the way, the mechanism for this in Rust, it's not great. It's, it's really, it's, it's kind of ugly. Even in the Rust book, they say like, they kind of are apologetic for it. They're like, yeah, it's not too good. We plan on doing something better later. Well, they haven't really done anything better later. But it doesn't matter. The power is there and you can use it. And also, by the way, Circle makes other languages look pretty, uh, look primitive here um, when it comes to metaprogramming. Wow, I got some, getting some more applause. Circle is amazing. Yeah. A, a bunch of you, a bunch of you I'm sure don't know what Circle is and we're just like going with peer pressure to do those claps. That's all right. Um, so the basic idea behind Circle, by the way, is take a function in C++, any function, a normal function, and run it at compile time. That's all. You do that, you have all the powerful metaprogramming facilities that you want. Um, so, by the way, I don't really care if it's circle. Well, I just want to use the results, right? I want to use those awesome libraries. If it's harder to program stuff, to metaprogram stuff, fine. Someone will do it. You don't need that many of them. Um, I just want to use them that exist. So, what's the gap? Well, we published a reflection TS. Uh, so Matush, Axel, and myself, we published this TS, which gave reflection in C++. Awesome, so close, so close to getting in the standard. TS is just right on the cusp. Uh, um, there was another paper that was written called Scalable Reflection by David, Wyatt, Andrew, and Faisal. Now, this paper said, hey, the reflection TS stuff, that's cool, that gives you the capability, but we really wanna do this 
with const expr functions. Okay, easier said than done. There's a bunch of stuff that's missing with const expr that you'd have to do in order to make that happen. Um, that's still in progress, but there are some controversies with regard to this um, right now. Uh, there's either the template metaprogramming approach, the thing that works, the reflection uh, TS, uh, versus the const expr metaprogramming, which has a better syntax, um, it's more approachable. Um, so that's an ongoing debate right now in the standard com standardization committee. There's also a big debate about whether we want to have a type-rich metaprogramming library or, or, or reflection library, or we want to have a monotype uh, library. And this just, this just basically means that when you reflect on a type, do you want to get a meta type and reflect on a function to get a meta function? Or do you want to reflect on anything and just get a poo, and then you can you just do whatever you can with the poo? Obviously, you can tell how I feel about that one. Um, but anyway, um, there's also a circle style metaprogramming, right? Which I presented to the committee, and I have never seen anything get rejected so bad. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a sec. I'm not bitter. I am. Uh, so the circle metaprogramming is is the clear winner, as I said before. Um, security was the concern. Uh, people were worried that, like, look, if you give people this much power at compile time, it could open a security hole. Yeah, yeah, could. Because you can execute arbitrary code. You can get code off the internet and compile it, and it will run arbitrary code on your computer. Now, um, it turns out that this is not an issue for Rust. I have never heard people in the Rust community complain about this at all, or Python, or, or anything else. It was just a concern in the committee. I think it was just the feeling of the room didn't just, people got scared. But anyway, um, the big thing here is that paradigm shifts in C++ or any large organization have to overcome a huge amount of inertia. It's a big push to change people's mindsets, okay? So when you see something like, uh, you know, concepts just recently getting into the standard, even though it almost got into C++ 11, if there's a lot of that inertia that needs to be overcome, and there are heroes that basically push through all this and get their, their features in. Um, so I, I have a talk called Don't Const Expert All the Things, which goes over circle and why it's the greatest thing in the world. And I even like act out with my children what happened in that committee meeting. Go watch that if, you're, if you want to be entertained about it. So we were going to talk about tools for system engineers. Let's do that. Memory safety features. Here we have a mutable value S. We get a couple of references to it. And then we output what's the first reference point to, what's the second reference point to. And what happens in Rust is you get an error. You can't take two references to the same thing and then expect to use them both later on. Right? It's trying to restrict the number of ways that you can get to a value. Um, it, 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 this, is, this is nice. Okay, and I'm gonna say it's a nice to have. Um, this is frequently touted as Rust's key feature, right? But I'm saying it's a nice to have, why? Um, when I look at the production issues that I've had, I haven't seen production issues due to bugs like this. I've seen way more production issues due to people um, writing weird code and having bad interfaces and, and getting things confused. Very rarely do I see this. Why, why is this mitigated in C++? Well, we've kind of adapted. We've adapted to having you know, uh, unsafety and, and dangling pointers and all that in C++. We have sanitizers these days. We've got a lot of training about how to use pointers properly. And we have best practices that people well know. We've got shared pointer and you use that as opposed to plain pointers. Um, that's, that I think has largely mitigated a bunch of these issues. Um, but it still is a nice to have, okay? Another cool feature, unimplemented. It's a little one here. Uh, here we have a struct point with an X and a Y, and impl, this is where you put your member functions. I know it's weird, whatever. Um, let's say we want to design this interface, and we have this function called origin, which we really want to return the origin point, the point with X is zero and Y is zero, but we're kind of busy right now. We just want to work on the interface. We don't want to fill in all the details. Well, you can just plug in this little hole here, unimplemented, and this will compile. If you try to run it, it'll like panic and freak out, but it allows you to use the type checker um, when you're designing your system. And here's an example where we put unimplemented in another, another spot. So you basically just plug this thing wherever you want as a TBD, 
and uh, it works. So, uh, is it runtime or compilation time? So this will compile just fine, right? If you try to run it and you hit something unimplemented, then it will just kind of freak out and, and like crash or whatever. Yeah, it behaves kind of like an assert. Yeah, something like that. Um, so why do I want this thing? It simplifies top-down interface-first development, which I highly recommend, uh, and that's what I do. And it enables better compiler and uh, editor interaction. So if you're working with code in C++ and you have something with a syntax error, then it all bets are off with the rest of your code, right? Whereas with something like this, I plug in unimplemented, the compiler is fine. It can, it can tell me documentation for something. It can tell me if I got a, a type wrong or something like that. It's still very useful. Like with modern day programming, our editors are getting way better at communicating with us back and forth. So it's neat. What's the gap? Um, well, you could use something like Decalvale for this, but you have to specify the type, which makes it unwieldy. Um, could we? What's that? Oh, you're saying it's just throwing an exception. Well, you can't do that in the middle of an expression. So there are some, some things you can do in certain places, but there's not something you can do in all the places. Thank you for raising that. Um, we could use a compiler intrinsic. Uh, maybe more powerful metaprogramming could produce something like this. But basically, we just need someone to write a paper, and we can close this gap. Uh, I think that probably the committee would be fine with something like this, so that's the gap. Write a paper. Um, another really cool thing is side-by-side -side tests. So here we have a function foo, that returns a plus 41, and we have our test right here, which makes sure that it works properly. The thing is that the test is right next to the function, right? Why would you want something like that? Well, why I want it is because all the benefits that you get from having documentation close to the code you get those same parallel benefits if you have the tests close to the code, right? Um, they're accurate, they're up to date, they're less likely to be uh, missed, someone forgets to update the test. No, it's all right there in the same place. It's a small thing, but it makes a big difference if you're, if you're programming at scale. So what's the gap here? A proposal. Um, can we do this with static initialization hacks? There are some test libraries out there that do static initialization hacks so that you can put the test next to the code. Um, probably that's not gonna be a good way to do it because of many reasons. Um, but then what happens? Now we have different compilation modes in C++. That's a, that opens up a whole can of worms. People are gonna be uncomfortable with that on the committee. Um, then do we have to get like agreement between build systems to make sure that they compile it in the same way? It's work, it's work. Um, this, this could be done, um, but it'll, it'll be a push to get something like this in C++. Uh, but it's very nice in Rust. So dot comments. Here we have that same function and some documentation for it. You can do this in C++. You can have documentation in C++. Uh, but you see this right here? This is a little code block, a little example, a little example code. Now, Rustdoc verifies this code compiles. It'll go in there and say, hey, this code compiles. Cool. So if you make a mistake in your docs that make it not compile, it'll tell you, and you won't be able to commit your code. It also verifies that the code works. So in Rustdocs, you'll see a lot of things like assert EQ. Um, your documentation now becomes part of your test suite. That's pretty nice. So why do I want that? Well, keeping examples correct, is very expensive. Why do I say it's expensive? Because if you want to keep your examples correct, you have to do very careful code reviews. Your code reviewer actually compiles that code and makes sure. Um, and you know anything that requires very careful code reviews, well, it doesn't actually happen, right? So just keeping examples correct is just unlikely without this kind of a feature. A lot of times examples are incorrect. And actually, in an earlier slide, I, I copied and pasted an example from uh, that CPP 11 or that that command line parser library, um, and that actually had a bug in it uh, because of this. So what's the gap? Well, uh, we have Doxygen, right? That's the most popular system for, for generating documentation in C++. There's Doxypress, which is growing in popularity, which is very nice, um, but it needs this additional feature. Um, 
The big issue with this would be build systems. Again, how do we get Doxygen to communicate with your build system to tell it, like, to compile this little snippet with the right libraries for this particular Dado? Um, it'd be a challenge, especially because we have so many build systems, although we are converging on CMake. Um, and there's also no organization to drive this kind of change. Uh, like, the standardization committee doesn't produce tools. Right? The standardization committee produces a specification for the language. What organization is producing the tools that make this nice? Uh, we don't have one. There's a gap there. All right, moving on. Concurrency. This is some concurrency code in Rust. All right? This is bounded function. What this is doing is this is creating a channel that can only have five uh, things in the channel at a time. All right? And what it returns is not the channel itself, but it returns a sender and a receiver. The sender, you send stuff into the channel. The receiver, you pull stuff out of the channel. All right? Here, what, what we do is, you know, don't, don't get hung up on the syntax here. We basically take the sender and we make a couple of different senders. We spawn off a couple of threads, and each of the threads starts sending stuff using their own special sender. You can't actually share a sender in Rust because borrow checker and stuff. Um, and then here we take the receiver and we pull information out of the receiver that was sent by the senders. So, um, what's the deal with this? Uh, well, first there's a slightly simpler version in the standard library. I'm using uh, Crossbeam. Um, but it eliminates a lot of common error classes. There's no mutex going on here. It's, it's a pretty easy abstraction to use and it works. I mean, that's the code for it. Now, if you try to make something, do something in the standard library, it's going to be a lot more complex than this. I guarantee it. So, why do I want this? What's the gap? I want it because engineers run away from concurrency in C++. And they absolutely should. Like, any engineer that wants to work on C++, if they say, hey, I'd like to use some concurrency over there, it's like, do you need it? Because if you don't, don't. It's dangerous. It is. You get it wrong. Um, why? Because they reach for error-prone tools. What are these error-prone tools that I'm talking about? The standard library. The standard library provides error-prone tools for doing concurrency, and that's it. That's true? <laughs> What's the gap? Um, well, one of the gaps is that in the standardization committee, we do bottom-up design more frequently than we do top-down design. What do I mean? They're trying to do the absolute lowest layer of, of gizmos, which you can theoretically write proper abstractions on top of. Um, and a lot of times when these proposals, proposals, are, proposals are sold, they say, yeah, but the, the top level thing is coming later, right? But then they get the lower level thing in, and then the top level thing, they just not consensus on it, and the only thing that's left is the really dangerous piece in C++, right? That's what we get. Um, there's just this approach that we have with C++. Um, there's also big disagreements about standard library scope. Some people believe in the committee that the standard library should only have the very lowest level stuff, and then people should use the great package universe in C++ instead of the standard library for the higher level abstractions. That's great in theory, but I happen to live in practice. And I know that that beautiful universe of packages which with these great abstractions is not used. Right? or is very rarely used. What I see more often than not are people using the low-level things that come in the standard library, and uh, they, I don't say foot gun anymore, what do I say? Uh, they thumb hammer themselves. So, uh, there's also a disagreement about uh, completeness and generality. People want, in the standardization committee, really want complete, they want to do every use case, including the really strange, like, semiconductor person, there's only one company that does it, and there's a guy in the basement working on a, on a weird microchip. It's got to work for his use case, too. Um, versus ergonomics, which is, hey, how about making it easy for the 90%, or even the 99%, like something? Um, this is just, we haven't agreed on this. And <laughs> you could probably tell where I stand on this. Um, all right, that's it for the features. Now I'm going to talk about Community, all right, which is probably the most interesting piece, uh, in my opinion, and you're probably thinking this is the most boring piece. 
But I hope you'll think that it's interesting when I get through this. All right, inclusivity. I know. Rust, this is, this is on Rust's website. It says, Rust, a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. I did not highlight empowering everyone. They did, right? That's really important for them. Now, when I talk about inclusivity, I want to clarify what I mean by that, all right? I'm going to start by saying what inclusivity is not, okay? It is not silencing, oppressing, or removing folks that disagree with a particular ideology. That is not inclusivity. Don't let people say that's what it is. It's not. It is not accepting one group by rejecting another. Nope. It is not mob rule. So, what is inclusivity, David? All right. Inclusivity is a mindset. And what is that mindset? Bringing people together, right? It's a mindset about making reasonable accommodation for folks to enter into your community. Keyword, reasonable. Also, keyword, accommodation. Use them both. It's about accepting people for who they are. And it's really about extending reach. So all of you in this room, you're in. You're in. The people who aren't, they're not, right? So if you have an inclusive mindset, it's about reaching out to the people that aren't in this room. You know, what, where, where are the people that, uh, the, what, what groups are not represented? Well, I'm sure a lot of Israelis are represented. Maybe we shouldn't go beyond the Israelis, but, you know, it could be Arabs. Like, I don't know. There are people that we're not reaching that we can reach, right? That's what inclusivity is. How do we bring them in? How do we make them feel welcome? How do we accept them? So uh, let's talk about inclusivity as it's rendered in Rust. Okay, the theme of RustConf 2020 uh, is inclusivity. All right, and I highly recommend watching the opening key keynote of this if you find this at all interesting. Uh, it was fascinating. Now, one of the things that came out is uh, I can do that, all right? See, the, the I there is, is it's hard to tell, but it's bolded. What does this mean? All right, now, I'm sure none, none of the talks this week were like this, but sometimes you go to a talk and someone comes up there and does a triple backflip and does some amazing things and like blows your mind with the acrobatics that they're doing and you walk away from that talk and you're like, I can't do that. Have any of you seen a talk like that? Surely not here, but I'm sure you've seen a talk like that. I've given talks like that. Um, what they're saying is when you walk away from a talk, this is what they say as community leaders. They say, we want people to say, I can do that. You see the difference? Right? You see, see what a big difference that can make? All right. Another thing is that they want to make sure that their community is accessible to beginners. When someone first comes to a meeting, to a conference, or something like that, if they're a beginner, you don't want them to walk away thinking, yeah, I didn't really fit in there. Uh, like, those people, they knew a whole bunch of stuff. I couldn't understand any conversation. Uh, Maybe I just got to get better, and then I can be part of that group. That's not what you want. You want people to be taught. You want them to learn when they come to your community. You want them to be welcomed. I'll give you an example uh, with Walter. So when I first went to C++ uh, standardization meeting, my first meeting ever, like I didn't know people. I mean, I might have recognized some people there. Walter. He like took me under his arm, like he took me under his wing, he like went to lunch with me, he explained stuff to me, he helped me understand what was going on, like he totally took care of me that first meeting. Thank you, Walter, really appreciate that. It was worth it. <laughs> so, so that, in that instance, that was a community that was accessible to me, a beginner to the standardization committee. So if we can move along this direction, make our communities accessible to beginners, I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, they also want to make Rust accessible to beginners. They had a huge focus where they were just like, let's get all the error messages and make them great for beginners. And if you get a, a, an error in Rust, it's not like a C++ error message, um, but it, it'll say like, um, but there can be errors that are confusing, and it'll say like, here's your error. 
um, it was probably this. And by the way, here's a link to a website um, that lists all the common ways that people get this error and how you can, how you can work around it. That's nice, right? There's this, this is why this community is growing, like leaps and bounds. This is a fantastic idea. Um, one of the things that I was actually really impressed at this conference is, is the use of the word trade-off. So their code of conduct, I've never heard of this before, but their code of conduct um, is not just thou shalt not do this thing and all these bad things. They also gave some suggestions, and one of them was, let's talk about trade-offs. So a lot of times you get into an argument with somebody, and you're like, I think it should be this. And someone says, no, I think it should be this. That's a terrible idea, and it's so wrong. And they just go back and forth, and it's, it's a big polemic. Like, people are just against the other person's idea. And they say, well, hang on a second. You don't have to do it like that. To make a community more inclusive, why don't you try this? Why don't you try saying, what you proposed, I think it has this set of trade-offs. These are the benefits. These are the drawbacks. What I'm proposing has a different set of trade-offs. These are the benefits, these are the drawbacks. Let's talk about the trade-offs. You see how you change the whole like, feeling of the conversation? It's no longer like a macho, I'm gonna punch you down type thing. It's, it turns into a mutual discovery of truth, right? It's pretty cool. And anyway, I, I'm very impressed when I heard the language at this conference, I heard a lot of people talking about trade-offs, which is great. I don't hear that at every conference that I go to. So, well done. Um, and they also have a big priority on spreading knowledge. You know something, you're an expert in something, give a talk that explains what you know to other people, right? Versus don't give a talk to show off. Give a talk that shares the knowledge and shares the information. They really focus on that in the inner group. They're like, oh, you know something? Then please teach the community about it. And that's how they get people up to speed. And they also, focus on accessible tooling. They say, hey, we're gonna use GitHub instead of emailing patches. Um, they use discourse as opposed to mailing lists. Why? Like, the, the older people are used to mailing lists. Like, they've used it for hundreds of years. Well, <laughs> maybe less than hundreds. I mean, I'm used to it. I'm used to mailing lists. But the new generation coming in, they're, for them, discourse is way easier. It's way more accessible. They're more used to it. Um, and you can reach them if you use discourse. Um, same thing with Discord versus IRC. These are all just kind of like, use the latest communication mechanisms to reach the most amount of people. And uh, they also consider essential mentoring and community building. It's something that they focus on, it's something that they do. So, I think you can clearly see why I want all this stuff. I hope you all want this stuff too. What's the gap in C++? Right? How do we get there? Well, we could potentially get some organizational help with this. Um, there's the C++ Alliance, there's the C++ Foundation, there's the Boost Foundation. These are all groups that could potentially come out with statements that are trying to do leadership along these lines. That could happen. There's Include C++, which, you know, they're, they're in pretty rough straits right now, you know, but they could emerge and, and, and really help with an initiative like this. And there's a question of what is our strategy? How are we gonna get there? It's great to have his goals, but what are our strategies gonna be? Are we going to try to cooperate with people? Or are we gonna make demands? Are we gonna say, hey, X conference, you know, your people are like being mean to each other and you gotta be nice, right? Or do you go in there and say, hey, I've got some ideas that can help you extend your community's reach. Like, can we help you with this? Can we cooperate with you? Generally, everybody wants to do these things. Um, there's also a question of how do we channel energy pr productively? Sometimes people can be very upset about lack of some of these things, right? The question is how do we take that energy, that, that anger, and make it productive and something that can improve the community versus something that can actually hurt the community and, and cause a lot of friction? Um, there's also a question of Strategically, do we want to change our structures? Like is the C++, ISO C++ standard so bad that we should just throw it out and start over again? Or do we want to work with them and improve existing structures? Like none of these are really invalid strategies, but I think we should choose one and that's the one we go with. 
And what is the goal? Right? We can't do everything at once. Um, so one thing that, that Rust did is they chose a goal. They created this new this initiative called the Ergonomics Initiative. And during that, that keynote that I mentioned earlier, they gave this, this quote, a paper cut for an experienced user can be a blocker for new users. Right? This is what led their ergonomics initiative. So here's an example. Like, ergonomics is so um, entrenched in the, in the Rust community that when I ran that test struct op program, that one we did earlier, with this, remember the, the struct op thing? I ran it with dash dash deb instead of debug, accidentally. And it gave some output here, but uh, the key thing to note in that error message is found argument dash dash deb, which wasn't expected or isn't valid. Did you mean dash dash debug? Wow. That community is thinking so much about ergonomics that just by using their libraries, your software is better. Pretty cool. Another example, package ergonomics. So I'm using org mode, uh, which is uh, this like cool plugin for Emacs, which is the best editor in the world. Um, has really good trade-offs. <laughs> um, and what happens is I have a little snippet of my code in there, and then here you see the code for an example. And what I do is I put my, my cursor over that code and I hit comma, comma, and it compiles it to make sure that all my code is syntax correct. Now the thing that's cool about this is if you see in that top line there, you see flags dash dash depth struct opt. What it did is it said, oh, you're using the struct opt, struct opt package? How do you pronounce that? Jeez. Um, it goes to this package daemon, it downloads the package, and then compiles my snippet with the package and verifies that the code works correctly. Even works with Rocket, that huge web framework. Like, that's nice, that's ergonomic. That made my slides better. And, and the Rust stuff that has libraries was checked. The C++ stuff with libraries, I did not check it. So another example of the package ergonomics, hello world in Rust, right? This is hello world. Cargo new hello-rust, it makes a new project. You go into the di directory, you call cargo run, it runs it, and it says hello world. And you output, and just outputting here, source main.rs, and you get hello world. They're thinking, hey, how often do you sit down and start with a hello world application? All the time. Let's make that really easy to do. Isn't that sweet? I think it's pretty sweet. So what do I want with ergonomics? I want ergonomics to be used as frequently as zero cost abstractions in discussion in C++. That would be sweet. I would love to see a C++ ergonomics initiative. I would love to see a WG21 ergonomics working group. I'd love to see a focus on this. So what's the gap? Gap is leadership. Who's gonna do this? Volunteers. If there is existing leadership, who would volunteer to be part of an ergonomics initiative? Just raise your hand if you would volunteer to be part of this thing. Good number of people, we got the volunteers. And we need sponsorship, some kind of organizational help, you know, uh, you know, Boost, the Boost Foundation could potentially do something like this. So we could get there. All right, now we're gonna talk about looking ahead. There's some good stuff. There's a lot here that is totally doable with C++. Medium-sized language features, they can happen. They have happened, they can happen. Takes a little while. Community building, cultural shifts, these are things that are doable. We can absolutely make that happen. Tooling, tooling you just gotta write the code. Like, we know how to do that. Now there's the bad news. There's a lot here that is hard, impossible, Substantial language features. Can we ever get something like circle metaprogramming in C++? Maybe. The thing is like our costs are 10 times higher than these newer languages. We have this, this inertia makes it very expensive. Um, and our latency is five times higher. I totally invented these numbers of course. But this is what it feels like. Um, it takes a long time to make changes. And I'm sure that Rust 
and these other languages are going to eventually hit this too, right? You get there at some point where the inertia is hard to overcome. And we have a ton of baggage. We've got backwards compatibility. Anytime someone who's written a standard, um, a, C, a C++ like core language change, usually you come in with a lot of enthusiasm if, you're, if it's your first time and like, hey, I got some examples of like how this would look, wouldn't this be awesome? And then all of a sudden they get hit with backwards compatibility and then you know, the head kind of droops. It's hard to do that with backwards compatibility. Um, and then we talked about inertia, just so hard to overcome the inertia. Um, so I want you to think about this question. Actually, just raise your hand. Do you think that C++ is under threat to become a legacy language? Yeah. yeah. We'll get there. Okay. Second question. Will C++ become a legacy language eventually? Is it, is it inevitable that it's going to become a legacy language? I see a lot of people raising their hands. You know, the last time I gave this talk, Lisa Lippincott raised her hand and she was like, that would be so depressing if <laughs> it didn't eventually die and people are still programming C++ a thousand years from now. <laughs> now this third question is, is C++ already a legacy language? Have we hit it? Couple hands, maybe, maybe. All right, now I'm gonna open up for questions. Um, there is one thing I wanna say. If you want a really awesome C++ job, use that QR link code, Adobe's got some. Uh, but that's the end of my talk and we'll take questions now. I don't know, I'll repeat it. I'd like to pull it, right? You presented a very nice picture for us, and they have the advantage that they serve the Twix Lake, they have better foundation, community which can only use it. So why do we waste our time on the Twix Plus, or we can offer better bus? What's the point? Thank you so much for that question. <laughs> Vittorio asked, well, Rust sounds great. Why are we doing anything with C++ at this point? Well, um, consider the prospect of doing a rewrite of something like Photoshop in Rust. It's not a thing, right? It's, like we have, the, the biggest benefit of C++ right now is the millions upon millions, probably billions of lines of software capital that have already been written, right? That is immense. You cannot touch that. So for somebody starting a new thing, like from scratch, by all means, go for Rust. There's a danger. Rust could go away at this point. It's not that big yet. Um, but with C++, uh, a lot of us work for existing companies. A lot of us work with big code bases. Uh, you can't just rewrite the whole thing. So Vittorio is, is stating that there's some good C++ interop. I have not seen this yet, uh, with Rust and C++. Um, even then, your people are still gonna have to know C++, right? So it is an additional complexity on top of it. Uh, so, other questions? Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, the talk about backward compatibility? But if you make a C++ class, just to throw, to throw away uh, some data that you don't really believe in. And from this point on, you have like only the new child and the other new What do you think about it? Uh, so the comment was, uh, well, if you make C++ and then get rid of all the backwards compatibility issues, you can build some stuff pretty easily. Well, uh, the problem, well, well, one observation is that C++ is every new revision of the C++ standard, right? And if we make a C++, which is not a new revision of the standard, 
what happens is we fragment our community. All right now, does this code work with this code? Because I can tell you if there's a C++ effort, C++ is not going to st st stay stagnant. Right? It's going to continue evolving because there are people highly invested in C++. So it's, it's, not, it's not an easy solution. And there's a risk of fragmentation with that one. Other questions? Daisy. What if you designed a language around compatibility with C++ without supersetting C++ and say like maybe had a very large corporation behind that language trying to build a community like this? So, uh, so Daisy suggested the creation of an experiment to uh, see if it would be possible to make a, a, a language designed for inter interop with C++, um, nah. <laughs> so I, I think that Carbon is an interesting initiative. And I'm involved with Carbon. Um, I, I go to their weekly meetings, and I've contributed a little bit. Um, it is an experiment. It'll be interesting to see what happens with it. Um, it might fail. It might succeed. We don't know. Let's let's see what happens. Yeah. Question in the back there. Do you think that you can eventually like sunset the role with legislative body embedding and lead to the whole system and like the Uh could we sidestep reflection by embedding lib clang in all the build systems? Um I don't know. I never I never really thought deeply about that. Um I don't know. I'd be interested in, in, if you have specific ideas, I'd be happy to, to hear more. Oh, Vittorio just is like, no. No. <laughs> just, just, no. Vittorio gave some good reasons. All right. Other questions? Comments? Oh, there's one the, over there. So the question is, um, since Circle has already um, outpaced Rust in a given area, is there a possibility of using that as a means to like continue and, and, and grow along those lines? Um, so right now, Circle um, is amazing, uh, but it's closed source. It's, uh, it's run by one person, Sean Baxter. Um, so it's kind of hard with it not being a community effort for it to be able to do something like that. But if it were to be open source and a bunch of people were to, were to get into it, there's, I think there's a possibility there, sure. Um, so, uh, it sounds, just so I make sure I understand you correctly, you're saying like, hey, what if there was like a great library or collection of libraries that was put out there and if people liked it, then they could like introduce them into the standard or adopt them, something like that? I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, and we have something like that, it's called Boost. Um, so, so, but the question is like, why do we need to change the language? Well. Language features, you kind of need to change the language to make them happen, right? Now, library features that are part of the language, um, it's basically what is built in to C++ when you get it. When you get C++, are the batteries included, or do you gotta go find the batteries somewhere else? And 
based on the way things currently are, the current environment, batteries are not included, and it's a really big pain in the neck to get batteries. So, uh, so in my opinion, I think it's, it's still valuable because of the community impact to introduce things into the standard library. I'm going I'm to go to another question, but give people some time. So I, I, I think that's kind of your point. You don't have meta programming to make these things into the language like yet. Uh, the comment was, that's, that's your point. We don't have meta programming enough to be able to make things like F -string, streams in the library. That's definitely part of it, yeah. Uh, up on the top there. Hold on. So, uh, question. Given what you said about libraries and the fact that the community tends to uh, get a thoughts to only give basic tools that are really applicable to everybody and they're lacking the, the uh, advanced features that 90% of uh, programmers need. Uh, why do you think uh, nothing has emerged so far that feels that gap or what, what do you imagine or how do you suggest that we will fill that gap? You know what I mean? uh, so the question is how can we fill the gap between, or why hasn't the gap already been filled between these really low level dangerous things that we have in the C++ standard library and what we really need like proper abstractions? Um, and I think that a lot of it is due to mindshare. Because on the C++ standardization committee we have absolutely brilliant minds, like some of the most brilliant minds uh, in the world I have met in the standardization committee. And be, they're all put to focus on the lower level bit, bits. Right? If, if, if they were instead to say like, hey, let's take this huge like, like wealth of mindshare and try to come up with something which is uh, good for the 90%, which is really ergonomic, I think they would be able to do it. So I think it's just a matter of focus. Uh, question is, how important is ISO governance? Should we get rid of it? Should we keep it? Um, I don't see a path to get ridding it, ridding, rid of it. Like ISO has like copyright on the C++ standard and that kind of thing. Um, should we get rid of it? Should we try? I, I think I'm leaning more towards let's see what we can do within ISO. Let's see how we can improve its processes to become more efficient, uh, more inclusive. Um, but there are trade-offs to everything, but that's, that's where I, I lean right now. O other question, there's one over here. This is a drawbox that you might, I understand that you don't want to do over but you talk uh, about the inclusivity. Um, so the question with inclusivity is how can we have inclusivity if the leadership is hostile to inclusivity? And I can tell you that one way to make a leader very hostile to inclusivity is to tell them that they suck. <laughs> with inclusivity, like, you are just the worst, you are terrible, um, they're not gonna wanna work with you, you know? And so I think that the way to overcome this is to work with people, like, to be friendly. I, I, I really don't think that leadership is hostile to inclusivity, although it may appear that way sometimes. I, I think that after having conversations with a lot of people involved in a lot of the scandals and stuff like that, like, they're, they're not like hostile to inclusivity. It makes some really dumb moves, I'll, I'll give you that. But, um, but I think that we can work with them. And if we need to, you know, cycle out leadership or whatever, that should be like a last resort, I think. Um, but I'm not sure about it, so like, 
I don't know. I don't have an I don't have a good solid like this is what we should do thing. So, but thank you for the question. Other question. Anybody want to throw a hardball after that one? Jeez. <laughs> All right. I don't see any more questions. Oh, <laughs> every time I say that, someone raises their hand. Good. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so where do I see package manager work being done? Uh, I think that an initiative could be created by a group of individuals. It could be um, like Boost Foundation or C++ Alliance or one of these things. Some, some, some group can get together and say, hey, we really want to try tackling the package manager problem. Or we might just get something organically. We have Conan, we have VC package. These things were not used very much a couple of years ago, but now they're increasing quite a bit. Who knows what it's going to look like in a few years? It might get the, the amount of um, mindshare that CMake has. Nobody ever thought a, a build system would emerge, but it did. So uh, I don't know. Uh, so the comment was, maybe we can, you know, get over backwards compatibility by having maybe flags which enable or disable features like in the source code itself or something like that. Uh, Vittorio proposed an epochs proposal um, that got absolutely obliterated. Um, but okay, maybe not so obliterated. It, I mean, it's at least limping. <laughs> um, so. I think that these are good ideas. There's definitely a possibility for for this stuff to happen. Maybe that's maybe that's the answer. Um, it just it takes the hard work to push for it, to work with people, to try to figure out the objections and overcome them. Um, maybe you can collaborate with Vittorio and, and I. Oh, Vittorio says he's volunteering. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so that that's that's it. So I'm going to close now. Oh, all right, you're the last one. You look really eager. Go ahead. Oh, comments. So a comment was uh, that we could use warning flags as a way to migrate, but uh, and get past backwards compatibility. Well, yes, but there's trade-offs with that too. Um, but that's a longer discussion, actually. So I am going to close. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your stuff.